This is one of the biggest energy mega projects in North America, but you've probably never heard of it. That's because it's a type of infrastructure that doesn't get as much attention as power plants or dams, despite being equally hard to build and just as crucial to the world's power supply. With the global energy crisis showing no signs of stopping, gas prices stuck at record highs and shortages made worse by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, ensuring there's enough of the stuff to go around has become a bit of a challenge. But when this enormous new facility in Canada completes in a few years, it could provide a much needed new source of fuel that will reach far and wide, as well as providing a huge economic boost the single largest private sector investment in the history of Canada. But in an industry where competition between countries is fiercer than ever, and with renewables on the rise, is this Canada's chance to become the next energy superpower? Or has it missed the boat? Okay, so let's get right to it. What exactly is this mega project, and why does it require digging up such a huge chunk of this stunning landscape? Well, it's all taking place in the small town of Kitty Mat, and the consortium behind it goes by the name of LNG Canada. LNG stands for Liquefied Natural Gas. And yes, we know what you're thinking. And yes, you're right. Fossil fuels are bad, and Canada is supposedly a world leader in renewable energy. So why is it building something like this? Well, Canada is one of the world's biggest producers of natural gas, but unlike the US, Qatar or Australia, it doesn't have any way of exporting it overseas. The gas industry, of course, sees a huge amount of gas underground in a, in a place called the Montney Basin, it's sort of northeastern British Columbia. And they're thinking, we, we, need, we need to get this stuff to market. This is, we need to be able to make some money from this. But the problem is that there's not a big population center nearby. They need to get it somewhere else. Hence why Canada is now building its first LNG scheme, set to cost more than 40 billion Canadian dollars in total. A task that, as these pictures clearly show, is more than a little bit complicated. But hang on a moment, let's take a step back before we go any further. Isn't natural gas a gas, not a liquid? Yes, it'll still be a gas when it comes into this new terminal via the Coastal Gas Link, a new 670 kilometer pipeline that runs all the way from the source up in Dawson Creek. Yes, that is the name of the town where the gas comes from. But if you want to send gas to another country or continent, there's an ocean in the way, and it's too far to simply build another pipeline. You'll need special tankers like these. To make it safe for transport, and so you can fit as much of it as possible on board, the gas has to be converted into a liquid. Then it's placed in these huge tanks and shipped over before it's turned back into a gas at the other end. It sounds simple when you summarise it like that, but the actual process is far from straightforward, and the same goes for the construction. Now, you'll be pleased to know that we're not going to try and explain what every single component on this site does, and how it's being built, because that would clearly take some time, so instead we're going to pick out a few highlights. Firstly, what are those things that look like huge cages covered in pipes? They're the process modules. 35 meters tall and weighing over 4,500 tons, this one was the first to be installed. Its job is to act as the entry point for gas coming in from the pipeline and to send it on to be treated and processed. These giant structures were all manufactured in China and carried over on ships. To get them from the port to the site, they had to be placed on the back of large transporters and carefully moved by road before being lowered onto specially built foundations. It wasn't a one-off task either. In total, more than a dozen of these modules are going in. Next, there's the absorber column. It's used to remove carbon dioxide from the gas before it's liquefied. Weighing over 800 tonnes and measuring 54 metres long, it's the largest single piece of equipment at the site, requiring several hours and three cranes to install. But the one thing you really can't help but notice when looking down from above is this. The massive tank where the gas is stored before it's piped onto those ships. 52 metres high and 92 metres in diameter, the colossal container is one of the biggest of its kind in the world. With a domed roof that had to be lifted into place very slowly. 
The lift was done using fans, which gradually pressurized the tank and raised the roof over three hours. Once in position, welders fixed it into place, and the air pressure inside could return to normal. With construction now over 70% complete, the terminal is set to come online sometime in the middle of this decade. And as for where all this gas is likely to go, well, Asia is the main target. It's the next closest continent to Canada's west coast. Many countries here are dependent on gas that has to be imported, and others are still burning coal, the worst of all fossil fuels. Yes, natural gas is a fossil fuel too, but it's not as bad as coal, so technically it is a lower carbon form of energy. But is it really going to get countries like China to stop using coal? China is still importing large amounts of LNG, but they're still building coal plants. They don't necessarily use it for electricity. It's often used for domestic consumption or it's used for uh, powering industry. So as far as getting off coal, well, that may be one of the, the possibilities that may happen. Or it could just be that China, places like China, will import LNG and still burn their domestic coal uh, because coal is, uh, is cheaper. So what about Europe, which has had to scramble over the past year to fill the gap in its gas supplies left behind by Russia and its war in Ukraine? Europe's energy crisis, one that could tilt not just the continent, but the entire world into a possible recession. According to Shell, one of the five companies behind LNG Canada, 2022 saw LNG imports to Europe increase by 60%. Surely then, one of the world's biggest gas producers suddenly becoming an exporter is good news for Europeans. Well, first off, they're in the opposite direction to Asia, which would mean very long journeys to reach them. Also, despite needing more of it in the short term, Europe is pushing hard to get off fossil fuels for good as soon as possible. And right there, you have one of the potential problems with this whole project. The timing. When it finally gets up and running, many nations are going to be looking at much cleaner alternatives to natural gas. And the chances are that overall demand will be lower by then. Canada will also be coming up against competitors that have already been doing LNG for years. Another issue is the cost, which has grown significantly, not on the LNG terminal, but with that pipeline. There's also the impacts on local communities, the First Nations. LNG Canada says it's working closely with them on the main site, but there have been disagreements further inland. Coastal gasoline pipeline was originally estimated to cost about, you know, around six billion dollars. The latest cost estimate is 14 billion, in these are Canadian dollars. And then at the same time, First Nations, the Aboriginal people of, uh, of the Montney Basin, uh, have been uh, concerned about the impacts of drilling and forestry on their, their hunting and fishing. Uh, rights. The industry had to make an agreement with the government and the First Nations that limited the amount of drilling in the basin, and that could push up the cost of supply as well. All in all, LNG Canada represents something of a gamble for the companies involved, and to some extent the country. It's undeniably impressive from a construction point of view, and it's offering something that's clearly needed at the moment all over the world. But as is often the case with these mega projects, whether it ends up being worth the costs, both financially and environmentally, remains to be seen. This video was sponsored by Bluebeam. You can learn more about how their digital construction tools are helping amazing teams around the world at the link below. There's also the chance to dive deeper on this and the other topics on our channel over on the World's Best Construction Podcast, available now wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you subscribe to the B1M.